Shalom Divine Service Setting 3, starting on page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given you your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God, and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Our intro for this morning is found printed in your bulletins. It's from Psalm 97. And we proclaim our intro responsibly. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord hate evil, he preserves the souls of his saints. Light is sown for the righteous, and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give your thanks at the remembrance of his holy name.
Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Place to wrath, 
For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 8th chapter. him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, have, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another one, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. We continue now with sharing our Christian faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, as found on page 192. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We continue now in your bulletins with a brief review from Luther's small catechism from the Table of Duties. To bishops, pastors, and preachers, the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well, 
and see that his children obey him with proper respect. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. What hearers owe their pastors? The Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, for the truly those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as a man who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. We continue now with singing together hymn number 863, Our Father by Whose Name, number 863.
A centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. All decent Americans are against child abuse. A number of years ago, there was a case of abuse against a toddler in and around the Fort Wayne area whose stepfather had burned a vulgar word into the child's back with a cigarette. Dot by painful dot. That was evil. It was wrong. I'm not saying I believe that was unfortunate. Or, I think it was a poor choice. Or, God forbid, to each his own, surely the stepfather was disturbed. He probably didn't mean it and took good care of the blisters and scabbing on the two-year-old's back. No! It was demonic. It was disgusting. And it was utterly despicable. Of that, we must be quite dogmatic. There are no circumstances, no excuses for such wicked behavior. We should be no less clear about the violent murder of babies that has been legalized by our own government and is carried out with cold, Nazi-like efficiency in clinics and hospitals. The mothers at least receive some anesthesia there is no mercy for the babies. It is far more painful and traumatic than cigarette burns. It is evil. It is wrong. It is disgusting and disturbing. The devil is not chased away by philosophy, but by dogma. By calling things what they are. The truth. All decent Americans are against murder, whether that be of puppies, or babies, or the mentally handicapped, or the elderly. All decent Americans must oppose this wherever they are able. The truth is, we live in a cruel, violent world. And for the most part, we do not make the laws. We are not in control. All we can do is vote when that time comes for our responsibility. Neither was the centurion in control. He served his government faithfully even though it was a purveyor of abortion and murder, of ethnic cleansing and corruption and of persecution of the church. For all of its grandeur and all of its glory and its learning and its architecture, its roads, its culture, Rome was still a terrible place. Believe it or not, America, even as it is now, is actually a far superior country, not just in government and structure, but also unbelievably in morality. Modern day America is actually still better morally than the Roman Empire. You do what you can, what you have the authority to do. The Christian law enforcement officer cannot arrest an abortionist for murder, even though he is killing babies. Shamefully, it is not illegal. In fact, the officer actually has to protect the man. But that same officer can vote in elections. He can lobby for causes. He can bring his influence to bear where he is able, in his community, among his family and friends. He can exercise his constitutional rights as an American citizen. No Christian, whether he be a sheriff's deputy, a doctor, or a farmer, has the right to strike out with violence and hatred. That is not our way. That is not allowed. 
That is not the way of Christ. Only the government, the law, can wield the sword. Playing off of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said, You shall not abort. But I say to you that anyone who has tired of his children, of the mess, the noise, the expense, anyone who has ever wished them away is guilty of abortion in his heart. We must repent. Evil is not overcome with evil, but with good. Especially the good of Good Friday. Jesus died also for abortionists and lazy politicians and for scared girls who were told it was okay by a seemingly knowledgeable nurse or medical assistant. The solution for all of our ills, social and otherwise, is the satisfaction of justice in the cross of Jesus, where he took the sins of all men upon himself. That is how the centurion, that consummate man of violence, was overcome. I can't possibly tell you when or where it occurred in his life. I just know that that is the way it all is. For we are not converted by the law, by beauty, by philosophy, or by reason. Political rallies against something don't make Christians. We are converted by forgiveness, by the loving intervention of God in our lives to cleanse and heal our fallen hearts. We are converted by being welcomed into the Father's house for the sake of the Son in the gift of the Spirit. And in our conversion, the devil is defeated. His prize is snatched away from him. Thus the centurion came to faith, came to Jesus in faith. He pleaded with our Lord, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed dreadfully tormented. A Roman officer commanding a cohort of 100 men cares deeply about the physical well-being of his servant, most likely a slave. Why would a Roman centurion care about the well-being of a slave? of someone who doesn't even rank in his, in, in his culture, in his society. But instead, he treats him and considers him as his own son. And the compassion of Christ volunteered to come and heal him. Imagine such an officer, such an offer. But centurions are always conscious of rank. This centurion recognized the power of God's grace for healing and forgiveness. And he immediately confesses that he was not worthy. He only desired a word. And his word is all that it will take. For in the word of Christ is power and authority. He only desired the same word of power and authority which had cleansed his own heart and brought him into the kingdom of God. Thus the centurion servant was healed. And he himself received a word of praise without equal for his faith. For his faith submitted to the authority and power of Jesus Christ. Faith, as scripture tells us, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In itself, faith is really nothing. It is the paper where the words are written. It's the grooved vinyl where the music is recorded. Christianity is not about faith. 
It is rather about that which faith lays hold of. Christ our Lord. Faith is the means whereby Christ dwells in us. He is what we hope for. What we do not see, but in whom we trust. Faith saves us by delivering us to Christ our Lord. That's the only way it works. Because to say the phrase, faith saves, is, a, is the equivalent to saying something like, the book reads. Thus Abraham believed the Lord, and was credited to him, unto him as righteousness. Now that's a verse so significant that it is, it is directly quoted three times in the New Testament, and alluded to at least once or twice more. Faith is the, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and it hopes in Christ. Because Christ is the one who saves. Since faith is the means of the indwelling of Christ, that's how faith saves. It is the common state of the battle. It recognizes preeminently, as did the centurion, that Jesus of Nazareth is God in our human flesh who has come to save us. When that is known, nothing else matters. Or more precisely, everything else falls into place. For if God has come in our flesh in order to save us, how can he fail to give us all other good things? as well. Is he not wiser than even our earthly fathers who know enough not to give us snakes when we ask for bread? If God has come in our flesh to save us, then how can his word ever lead us astray? If God has come in our human flesh to save us, then we are saved. Our pride and our ambition, they lose their momentum. We are satisfied in his death and his resurrection. We forget ourselves. We are fully his, and because of that, we are now perfectly innocent of all sins. He chooses in grace, in his grace, to come under our roof. Not just into our homes or into our souls, but into our bodies. He enters our mouths to dwell in our hearts, to purify our souls by means of the Holy Communion. The bread which we break is His holy body. The wine which we bless is His holy blood. It is given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, for the strengthening of faith, for encouragement, for healing, for the sake of love. Thus he overcomes our violence, our hatred, and our cowardice by his brave, selfless love. I greatly appreciate the work of our national and local and religiously affiliated right to life groups and their efforts to fight against the evil of abortion, of the legally sanctioned murder of as yet unborn children. They fight for the recognition of the legal rights of human beings who have not yet left the womb of their mothers. That is a fine goal. But honestly, it is not mine. I don't think I'm against that just that my priority is not quite in the same place. My greatest concern about abortion is not that it become illegal, but that it become unthinkable. What happens by the change of law? The other only occurs with the change of hearts, minds, and souls. And that is something that we cannot do. For that, the God who spoke into creation everything from out of nothing must speak his life-giving word anew. When Christ speaks, 
the most miraculous, unbelievable things happen. The universe comes into existence. Water is turned into wine. The sick are healed. The demons flee in fear. And the dead are raised to life again. He speaks the word, and it is so. He says, go to the devil, and the devil goes. He says, come to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes. He says, let it be done for you as you have believed. And it is. You are no longer deteriorating and disintegrating from the leprosy of sin. By the power of pro and promise of his word, combined with the simple, plain water used in your baptism, you are righteous before God, clean and made new. And by that same promise, you will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, both regularly when our Lord brings it to us here around the altar, and when he brings us to himself. Blessed be the name of Jesus who makes all things new. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all of our human understanding keep your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus. We continue now with singing together. Our offertory is found beginning on the bottom of page 192, Created Me. Please rise.
Especially we pray for our local law enforcement and Dalton, Vanessa, Brian, Erica, and Anthony in our sheriff's office. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, if you will, you can make us clean and heal every disease. You have stretched out your hand in Christ Jesus to give eternal salvation. Be pleased also to stretch out your hand to relieve those in need. Especially we pray for Patricia, Mary, Evelyn, and their ongoing needs. For Mark, Barbara, Tony, and Mara, and their afflictions. For the family of Jim Morris as they mourn his death. For the safety of all those who travel during a, during a time of snow and winter weather. For Mara's uncle Lawrence being treated in the hospital, along with everyone else affected by the pandemic. And for all those we remember now in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all life, bring an end to abortion and euthanasia, to banish from among us the production and destruction of embryonic brothers and sisters. And turn the hearts of those who permit, promote, and participate in violence against life. To strengthen all the medical professionals always to care and never to kill. To move all public officials and elected authorities in support of policies, laws, and verdicts that protect the least of these. To defend our land from division, from aggression, and from the deception of death used as a solution and to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all compassion, preserve from despair everyone facing infertility, unexpected pregnancy, disability, or terminal diagnosis, to relieve those burdened by gender dysphoria, to liberate any enslaved by adultery or perversion, to deliver those scheduled for abortion, to grant safe homes and healthy families to those awaiting adoption, to absolve the guilt and ease the grief of those broken by the abortion of their own children, to work comfort and peace within those surviving the suicides of loved ones, to uphold and heal those suffering discomfort and disease, and to give all who are approaching death a blessed end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Father, gladden us in celebrating gifts of marriage, family, and length of days, especially Randy, Andre, and all those celebrating birthdays, as well as all those celebrating anniversaries. Give us courage in speaking your truth and compassion in showing your love. To make us ambassadors of gospel joy in every difficulty and agents of gospel hope in all affliction. To impart gentleness and respect to our words and bestow sensitivity and winsomeness upon our ways. And to bid us rejoice when any heart changes and delight with every saved life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, do not throw us into the hour of darkness of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Strengthen and preserve our faith in Christ Jesus, our only mediator, by whom we also are welcome to recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as true Israelites. When our last hour comes, welcome us as brothers and sisters of Christ, baptized into his name, and therefore as sons of your kingdom by grace, through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our 
daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you Beautiful Savior, number 537. 